Hi, I'm Dr. Joel Henriad. Welcome to Enamel Pearls. On today's episode, I'm going to teach you how to choose the right implant for a site. It's important that our implant is not too big, not too small. We want it to be just right, like a Goldilocks implant. There are some specific measurements that help us get there. Let's get started. For an implant to be healthy, it needs to be surrounded by enough gum and bone tissue. A diagram is going to help us understand the spacing. Let's draw our number 29. Let's draw a big old fat number 31, and we have our bone. And that is the first question that needs to be answered. How much bone is present? The best place to find this out is on a CT scan, because we need to define what is our mesiodistal space, what is our apical coronal space, what is our occlusal space, and finally, where are our anatomical limitations? Let's look at an example of how we can easily measure bone volume on a cone beam CT. This is a focused field cone beam CT from the Kodak 9000 3D. We're looking at the lower right. I've mapped out the mandibular canal and mental foramen, so now we can measure the bone dimensions. You can appreciate this man has a tremendous amount of bone volume. We have 17 millimeters from the bone crest to the nerve, 12 millimeters of ridge width. After measuring your dimensions, you can place a digital implant and see how it fits within the available bone. If only everyone had this much. We know that the mental foramen exits usually beneath the first and second premolars. And our inferior alveolar nerve is going to travel right below our implant side if we're working on the lower right. The first number I want you to memorize is the number two. And two stands for two millimeters from the bottom of our implant to any anatomical limitation. Now when I say anatomical limitation, I'm talking about nerves, arteries, floor of the mouth, floor of the nose, the sinus floor, sublingual fossa, anything that if you hit and violate is going to be a problem. So in this area, that is our inferior alveolar nerve. If you're measuring your dimensions from something other than CT, remember there can be up to 35% distortion. That's why we all have a drawer with transparencies in it from the old days where we had to hold up a measurement on top of the light box. Those days are over with CT. The last dimension we need to account for is our occlusal space. Remember that we have to account for the tissue height, the restorative material, our abutment, and where's the position of the opposing dentition. When you add all of the minimums up, it comes out to seven millimeters. So we need to plan at least seven millimeters of height from the top of our implant to our opposing dentition. In a pinch, you can use a little less with a screw retained restoration, but we'd really like to have more so you have all of the freedom of your emergence profile. That's a messy drawing. The mesiodistal space determines our implant diameter. A healthy implant needs at least one and a half to two millimeters of bone between it and the neighboring tooth. So here's our implant, and we need to have, again, two millimeters of space between edge of the implant to edge of the tooth. Choosing our implant diameter also depends on our ridge width. Let me draw the shape of our lower ridge. Here's our nerve canal. Our implant needs to be two millimeters less diameter than our ridge width to have that healthy one to two millimeters of bone surrounding the implant. What if we have two implants next to each other? You need more space implant to implant than between implants and teeth. This is because the periodontal ligament provides a good blood supply to the adjacent bone. Since there is no periodontal ligament around implants, it is best to have extra bone volume between implants. Our guideline is for implants to be three to four millimeters from each other. This allows for cleansability and enough biologic space for the implants not to impact the neighboring bone. Let's go through a case. Here's a 71-year-old man who needs replacement of number four. I don't have the CT, but I'll give you the measurements. We have nine millimeters from mesial to distal, eight and a half millimeters buccal to lingual, and 13 millimeters from the alveolar crest to the sinus. To figure out the appropriate size implant, we subtract two millimeters from each tooth to the implant, giving us a five millimeter maximum implant diameter, mesio to distal. Notice that the marginal ridges converge slightly, so for better emergence, we may favor a slightly smaller implant. 
There's enough buccal lingual width for up to a 5mm implant. Length isn't an issue, and it's okay for the implant to touch the sinus floor. We actually did a small sinus bump, so there's plenty of room for our 4.1 by 13 millimeter Zimmer tapered screw vent implant. When it was ready for restoration, our lab milled a nice custom abutment with ideal emergence and the final restoration looks great. Now you have a simple recipe for your next implant case. Remember the three numbers. Stay two millimeters away from your adjacent teeth, two millimeters away from anatomical limitations. Give yourself seven millimeters of occlusal space and keep your implants three millimeters apart from one another. For more clinical tips, go to Enamel Pearls.